is a reader. He is a reader of robotics at the Department of Engineering at the University of Cambridge. He received his bachelor and master degree as a mechanical engineering at Tokyo University of Science in Japan and the PhD at the University of Zurich in Switzerland. During the PhD, uh, Fumiya was also engaged in biomechanics research of the human locomotion at the Locomotion Laboratory, University of Vienna in Germany. And uh, while uh, he worked as a postdoctoral associate at Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory at Massachusetts Institute of Technology in USA, he uh, was awarded with the fellowship for uh, prospective researchers from the Swiss National Science Foundation. And then the Swiss National Science Foundation professorship hosted by ATH in Zurich. In 2014, he moved to the University of Cambridge where he is the director of a bioinspired robotics laboratory. So, uh, Professor Ieda will uh, provide us with a presentation on sensing and control of soft wearable robots. So, I will leave the, room to the floor to Kumiya Ieda. Please, uh, Matteo, if you can remove the slide. Okay, um, hope you can hear me well. Yes. Okay, very good. Good, and do you see my screen? Yes, okay. Excellent. Yeah, all right. So then uh, let me get started. Uh, so my name is uh, Fumiya Ida from uh, University of Cambridge and Bioinspired Robotics Lab. And uh, I, well, first of all, I'd like to thank all the organizers uh, having me this, to this uh, exciting event um, and the opportunity uh, to introduce our research project. So um, I have been working on um, the area of bio-inspired robotics, trying to inspire from nature to improve our robotic system. And in this context, uh, soft robotics is one of the main, um, main challenges we have been working on in the last 10 or 15 years. And uh, so today I would like to uh, give a bit of focus on the topic of uh, soft robot sensing and the control and hopefully we can use it for the purpose of a wearable robot in the future so that it can be associated with the rehabilitation applications. So um, here is the outline of my presentation today. So I will start with a, a brief introduction of big picture of our research project on uh, embodied intelligence uh, and how we can treat self-organization in this process of uh, uh, dealing with soft uh, robot control and sensing. Uh, and then uh, we go to a uh, little more details into the uh, technical, te technicality of sensing and the materials. Uh, and the, one of the main um, the take home message I want to present here is the, uh, what we call the sensor morphology and how we can play the uh, role as sensor morphology plays a role for the control of soft robotics. And then I uh, will go into the problem of soft robot control afterwards. Okay, uh, very good. So let me just start with a very brief introduction of embodied intelligence. So uh, just give you a big picture of where we stand to uh, understand the soft robots in the bigger context. So what we are interested in is the human growth and learning. So one of the most exciting things uh, is that our body can grow and learn for the enormous uh, complicated uh, pro uh, problems and tasks. and. Uh, how all these things come about is the big mystery. Uh, so here is the, uh, some of the research uh, done in um, human development uh, research that uh, we all know that uh, we start our life with a very, very small um, entity and then grow into the massive organism before the, uh, before the birth. Then after birth, we become a really, really big uh, even farther. So um, the, 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 far, the, the most interesting thing is that, um, you know, it, it, see, even since the beginning of our life, our body uh, consists of uh, the nervous system and other uh, soft substances. So the green part shown in this left-hand side picture here 
is that uh, that consists of uh, um, the nervous uh, system. Like we have a basic uh, neurons and uh, cell cultures uh, growing into together with the rest of the body, and all other parts are the um, the soft body, right? So ever since the beginning of our life, our brain and body grow together, uh, so that we have a very good coordination between the um, the cognitive process and the body um, sensor motor coordination all together. So how can we uh, really think of such an uh, interesting process, the growth and learning process in the systematic matter so that we can use it for uh, development of robotic system as well? Uh, and um, so one of the way we need to look at is the, actually the scalability of the whole system, right? So we, uh, we all start with one cell at the beginning of our life. Uh, and then grow into the, uh, the bag of uh, 10 to the 10 cells before birth. Uh, and then after birth, we grow farther into about a thousand times it become, uh, um, becoming an adult. So in this all, uh, all this process, the most interesting thing is the, the scalability. We start from one cell and all the way to the 10 to the 13 cells. Uh, but also another thing is that we differentiate into all different kinds of materials uh, or structures from a nervous system to a hair to muscles uh, and the other uh, internal organs. So this scalability is a really enormous thing in biology and how we can do similar thing in robotics is actually one of the biggest challenge in, in robotic science from my point of view. Uh, and if you want to do it, I think, um, you know, we really need to think about material level intelligence, but also uh, we need to think about how to do the programmability of materials, like how, um, you know, smaller system grow into larger structures uh, in a, a sequential and the program matter, uh, manner. And um, the stability is another important thing. Um, but generally speaking, I think uh, soft robotics is a very important um, uh, a role in this picture because you know, basically only 15% of our entire body uh, is the rigid materials and everything else is soft, right? So how we can make our soft substances into many different um, organisms from a, a nervous system to muscles, to sensors, to internal organs. Uh, so that's a, a kind of really big, big picture of our research uh, in the context of embodied intelligence and self-organization. So if you, uh, we focus a little bit on the adult side of the system, so how we can deal with such a complex system in a systematic manner. So the embodied intelligence is a concept that we need to really think about uh, in this context because um, uh, body plays a significant role in the way how we uh, become intelligent. So, um, you know, what we are doing in our daily life is the interaction with the environment, but the interaction with the environment is triggered by uh, embodied interaction as well as informational processing on top of it. So how we can understand the basic um, can, uh, interactions uh, between the uh, uh, body and the environment is triggered by mechanical system of the body, but also the sensory system of the body. Uh, they, they are coming together uh, to, um, to, to get the brain system working all together. So uh, this is a really important process, how we can understand each of these arrows um, influencing to each other. Uh, and the sensor system, mechanical system are actually playing a role. And we want to understand how these two subsystems uh, can be understood in the context of a very complex uh, uh, large organism like uh, ourselves. So just to um, start um, its investigation of this complex system, I want to introduce a, a basic um, um, uh, neuroscience, uh, behavioral neuroscience research that we have done uh, quite some time ago. Uh, and uh, uh, because I think the understanding of reflex uh, based behaviors is very important for our understanding of human uh, as well as the soft robots. So uh, our reflexes play a very, very important role in our, in our daily activities. Uh, uh, our, most of the activities we do in, in daily life is based on the reflexes. So what, what are the reflexes? So reflexes are um, the behavior uh, primitives that triggered by our backbone. So almost all of our muscles in our body are connected directly to our backbone, right? So the backbone have a, a lot of neural uh, neurons that is um, connected indirectly to the, uh, the central brain. 
but the, actually our neural circuit in our backbone does a lot of lots of activities uh, even without uh, getting intervention from the central brain. So the brain, uh, the uh, backbone, understanding of backbone circuit it actually plays a very important uh, role in understanding our, our daily behaviors. So uh, how does this uh, the, the reflex behavior works is that basically we get the sensor signal from the muscles, uh, such as displacement of muscles or force uh, uh, signal from muscles or tendons uh, uh, brought into the uh, circuits in our backbone. Uh, and then, the, the, and then there's some, there's some uh, computation happens in backbone uh, to uh, leads to some uh, motor signal afterwards sent back to the uh, muscles, right? So this signal uh, pathway uh, can happen even without uh, central brain uh, intervention. So uh, that's why I think it's very important. It's relatively simple to understand how muscles actually do the sensor motor coordination. Uh, but on the other hand, there are many, many different kinds of reflexes as it's uh, implemented in our body. So here we are just uh, introducing four different types of reflexes. Uh, first one is a myotatic reflex, which is uh, we actually know quite well when we have uh, uh, heavy things we have in our hand, our muscles automatically react to it, right? So this is a myotatic reflex that if you uh, sense something heavy and the muscle automatically react to it. Uh, and uh, uh, reverse myotatic reflex is another important reflex that we, basic reflex we have that if we have some weight in our uh, hand, um, we, we don't always uh, go against this weight because if we have too heavy weight, our muscle is gonna be broken. So there's a circuit, like if you have a, a excessive weight on your hand or muscles, you release a, a resisting to this weight. So this is a reverse myotatic reflex. Um, and another uh, interesting uh, reflex is the reciprocal inhibition. Um, here we have, uh, uh, it, when we think of the muscles uh, placed in uh, antagon antagonistic uh, manner, uh, muscles should not fight to each other, right? So once one muscle is activated, the other muscle has to be uh, released. And uh, this is another reflex we can, we can think about. So, uh, and then uh, another reflex we can talk about is a wi withdrawal reflex, right? If you have uh, some extrinsic uh, signals, like, you know, uh, touching a fire or something really hot or something painful, the muscles automatically react to this extrinsic sensors so that we don't burn our uh, fingers and the, and the skins. So as you can see, uh, there are uh, hundreds and hundreds of uh, reflexes like that implemented in our uh, spinal cord. Uh, and these are, are playing a very, very important role. And if you look at some uh, complex behavior when we step into something painful, we need to you know, do a lot of things in a, a very short reaction time. That, uh, for example, you need to coordinate all these muscles to retract your, uh, your leg while you're balancing your whole body so that we don't uh, fall down. So we can actually think of a lot of lots of interesting uh, behavior just by thinking about reflexes. Uh, but the problem here is that how all the sensor motor coordination can be programmed uh, in a systematic manner, because uh, even though this is, they are very important, very difficult to program all these thousands of different reflexes independently. Uh, and these are not you know, innate thing, right? It's not given at the birth, but it has to develop over time when uh, you grow up. So we are kind of wondering what are the roles of sensors and the control in this context, like how we can make it such a complex uh, reflex circuit automatically uh, without um, you know, humans uh, designing the every uh, little things. So one of the, the principles that we are exploring here is the, the so-called muscle twitch hypothesis. So this is a collaboration uh, project with uh, Mark Brumbell, who's a neuroscientist in the uh, United States. Uh, and we have been interested in the roles of a muscle twitches. So all, you know, we all know that when we're sleeping, our muscles are um, activated in a, in, a, in a random way that without any conscious, right? So uh, here we're hypothesizing such a random action in the muscles play a role of how uh, the reflex, re reflexes can be automatically programmed and uh, self-organized. So the idea here is that uh, you know even though we have um, the motor neurons uh, and the sensors all placed in our body, uh, our nervous system don't know how they are correlated to each other. 
So our hypothesis is that this muscle twitches can make this connection uh, uh, obvious uh, because of the, uh, the correlation to the body. So here, uh, the Mark did a, a neuroscience research on the sleeping rat, uh, analyzing how the motion of the body as well as the muscle uh, activities can be correlated to each other. So here we have, uh, I don't know the details of this experiment, but what we found interesting is that the muscle activities are relatively random, but the muscle activities and the motions are quite correlated to uh, each other so that our hypothesis can be uh, indirectly proof, uh, proven in this kind of neuroscience experiment. Uh, but only, unfortunately, this kind of neuroscience experiment cannot you know, do the, uh, the details of the mechanism on the muscle twitch hypothesis. And that's why we started doing some uh, simulation uh, work, computational neuroscience to understand whether um, this kind of um, uh, muscle twitches can lead to self-organization of uh, reflexes and uh, in what way uh, we can make it uh, uh, complex circuit developed. So here uh, we think of uh, some really basic motor system and a sensor system uh, in the uh, physical uh, simulation. Uh, and then think of how we can uh, activate the, uh, the random signal on the muscles by using spontaneous motor activity. So this is basically the random muscle twitch generator uh, activating the muscles. Uh, but the real question is how motor action and the sensor signals can be uh, correlated to each other and uh, how, um, how this kind of correlation can be picked up automatically by using uh, some basic neural network. So we use all the known uh, basic uh, uh, components such as heavy and learning and the muscle models uh, and the sensor models. Uh, but what we basically do is uh, uh, applying some heavy and learning rules so that the uh, fire together, uh, 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 connect together, wire together, uh, principles by using heavy and learning uh, and all these kind of things can be correlated through the physical body. Uh, the important things that we need to think about is the muscle model here, that, uh, because we cannot use any muscle model in this kind of system because the mechanical dynamics of body is very important. When we're sleeping, our body is a passive element uh, and the muscle reaction can uh, propagate through our passive body. And that plays a very important role uh, in the understanding of self-organization here, but also the sensor signals is important, like what kind of sensor we use. Uh, and especially here, the muscle spindle measures the deformation of the body and the Golgi tendon organs measure the force of the body rather than the position of the, uh, uh, the joint and so on. So uh, by using this kind of setup, we can really understand how our, how our uh, self-organization of our sensor motor coordination can, um, can be picked up. So the, the simplest coordination we can think about is the one joint and two muscle system, right? So if you have a one joint with the uh, lever attached to it, and then this lever is connected to the motor, uh, a pair of motor, uh, and on the way we have a um, displacement sensor and the force sensor atta attached to it. We also have a, some uh, extrinsic sensor, like a touch sensor at the end of the arm so that we can actually see the contact with the environment. So if you have a, this kind of configuration, uh, we can uh, see a lot of interesting things, even though it's a very simple system, right? So here we think of the muscle twitch of a blue motor and the red motor, and the trigger of these motors can read automatically to the activation of sensor signals uh, on the displacement sensor and also force sensor. Um, and uh, if we activate the other uh, motors, then uh, we see obviously the opposite side uh, sensors are uh, um, uh, reacted. Uh, and then that will lead to uh, some correlation between sensor and motors. Uh, extrinsic sensors are also activated when we have something uh, around in the environment. So we actually feel some contact or some resistance from the uh, air or fluid uh, from the environment. And all these things are kind of correlated automatically because of the mechanical structure of the body. So uh, the, interestingly, um, you know, we start with a very um, uh, uh, simplistic neural uh, network model that we have all motors, uh, node and sensor mode uh, connected uh, in the uh, fully connected fashion. So all the motors and sensors are connected. 
uh, after doing random activation of these muscles, we actually see some of the uh, sensor signal, sensor motor coordination can automatically picked up by the uh, heavy end learning so that we can actually see the motor and how the motors and sensors are uh, related to each other. So once we have this kind of connections, we can do the opposite direction activation, right? If you have a sensor input in the system, the motor can be uh, reacted to it. So in this way, you can have a sensor motor coordination really nicely uh, in this, such a uh, simple setup. So the, the beauty of this kind of uh, approach is that there's a scalability of the system. So here we have a one joint and two muscle uh, arrangement, but we can e easily upgrade it into the larger system like a two joint and four muscle system. And here we have a four muscles uh, and uh, eight sensors attached to it. But uh, uh, just by randomly activating all these muscles, sensor motor coordination can be automatically uh, picked up by heavy and learning, uh, just like uh, the uh, simpler system. Uh, and we can also even in, uh, upgrade it into more complicated systems like a two joint and eight muscles, and still we can work uh, similar um, uh, uh, correlation between sensor and motor signals. So this is really interesting because we can make it arbitrary complex, but still we can uh, learn all the sensor motor coordinations uh, in a self-organizing fashion. So the, the next question is uh, how complex we can go with this uh, uh, structure. So in this case, uh, we don't uh, uh, have uh, more muscles, but we have connected sensor and uh, more muscles and sensors in the more complicated fashions. So we have inspired from the, uh, the leg muscle coordination uh, uh, configuration that we, here we have a two joint and eight muscles attached to the two dimensional leg. Uh, and then the interesting thing is that here muscles and joints are not one-to-one -one coordination. Some of the muscles are connected over two joints and so on. So the activation of muscle signal uh, the sensors uh, signals are not very trivial. Then accordingly, we see the sensor motor map is very, very complex as you can see here. But interestingly, as you can see in this video, at the beginning, we have a randomly activating muscles uh, and see how the sensor motor coordination can be picked up. Uh, but after a while, uh, after all this, uh, the training period, this, um, this simulated robot can actually use this correlation to do a jumping behavior like this, right? So this is a really interesting that the, we don't need to program very complex sensor motor coordination in the system, but the random activation of muscles can actually automatically lead to the programming of a, a relatively complex system like this. And again, the important uh, point I want to uh, emphasize here is that embodiment plays an important role that the uh, you know, type of muscles we use, kind of sensors we use, but also how they are connected to each other are playing an important role uh, for the self-organization of sensor motor circuits. And we cannot really underestimate the role of relatively simple sensor motor coordination like uh, uh, reflexes because we can do complex uh, behaviors like a hopping behavior like this. And uh, ultimately we can also do more complex problems like uh, bipedal locomotion demonstrated by Helmut Geyer um, quite some time ago that the bipedal walking can be achieved only from the reflex circuits. And uh, we can actually do quite uh, complex behaviors uh, with this. Um, so hopefully you understand the role of uh, uh, sensor motor coordination. And uh, I think that this is really important to understand why we need to think about uh, what are the uh, requirements for the sensors and what the kind of control we need to control principles we need to think about. Uh, but obviously all of this uh, interesting research were done only in simulation so far because uh, uh, we have a very limited technologies uh, in, um, in developing self-organization of sensor motor control. So we have been uh, actively uh, uh, engaged in the research of uh, soft functional materials because uh, I think this is the fundamental bottlenecks at the moment for our soft robots uh, um, behaving like uh, ourselves. So um, the most important principle of soft uh, robotics is the how we can develop uh, interesting soft functional materials. So the soft functional materials is basically bridging uh, the physical stimuli into the uh, physical functions. 
So we can think of all different kinds of physical stimuli from force, temperature, chemical, electrical uh, input, but all the stimuli has to be somehow uh, translated into the uh, functions in the end, such as walking, grasping, or you know, um, a reaction of our optics or auditory systems and so on. Uh, so the, the soft functional material is very important. Uh, it's not just a, a functional materials, right? The deformation plays a very important role as we saw in the previous examples. So we want to emphasize that the functional materials should be soft and deformable. And this is the fundamental uh, challenges. So uh, we have been uh, investigating, okay, in the first place, what does it mean by being soft? The, what, what, is, what is soft materials, right? So most of the conventional robots are made out of the rigid materials, we usually uh, young modulus in the order of a gigapascal. Uh, but if we look at our body, uh, human bodies, uh, um, our substances are made out of uh, soft materials, usually uh, young modulus of a kilopascal order. So we need to be selective in the choice of materials, what kind of materials we should use uh, for uh, building our uh, uh, our function materials and soft robots. Uh, so this is one of the important principles how we can go lower in the young modulus. Uh, but on top of that, we need to think about how we can functionalize these materials, right? So I'm not an expert of material science, but there are lots of lots of techniques that we can function uh, functionalize soft materials. Uh, one of the typical ways is that we can actually mix uh, soft materials uh, with some functional uh, compounds. Uh, in this particular case, we're looking at how we can electrically functionalizing uh, soft materials. So basically we can put some uh, uh, electrically conductive filler into the soft materials, uh, and then we can mix them nicely so that we can make uh, soft materials functionalize uh, in certain ways. So in this particular case, we want to make a soft materials electrically conductive. Uh, but of course, there are a lot of challenges in, in terms of how we can maintain the soft material dynamics while uh, including some uh, 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 fillers. Uh, and in this case, uh, if we put too much fillers, uh, we can, uh, if we include a lot of uh, uh, um, electrically conductive compounds, then we can make it really electrically conductive, but we lose the um, good property of soft materials at the same time. So there are lots of interesting trade-offs we need to look up, like how we can maintain the soft materials uh, in, in a preferred manner while functionalizing soft uh, structure. Um, there are lots of uh, uh, other type of soft functional materials such as soft healing materials uh, that was uh, reviewed by uh, one of our colleagues in uh, Brussels. Uh, and uh, the soft healing materials is also very interesting in the sense that the materials can actually react by itself, even the temperature, uh, loom temperature, the, um, the broken materials can come back to uh, original uh, structure. Uh, and uh, we can also make it a more advanced uh, adaptation by using uh, self-healing materials and so on. So here by introducing this kind of uh, material level self-healing, then we can uh, create the new kind of design principles of self-organization like biological systems. Like our body has, uh, for example, the Wolf's law and the Davis law that the broken structure can be healed and, and, and strengthened um, because of the bro brokage. Uh, but also the soft materials can be even softer uh, when you stretch it enough, right? So, so this kind of principles are very interesting and important for the future of soft uh, self-organizing soft materials. Uh, we should also look at the other types of uh, um, uh, functionalities in soft structures. So here we have a soft uh, materials and adhesiveness introduced by Sam Bae Kim uh, that uh, usually soft materials comes with adhesiveness for, for free, right? So if you have a soft materials, it becomes more adhesive and this uh, stickiness can be actually used for uh, positive uh, functions for uh, different kind of uh, robots, for, for example, climbing robots. Uh, and adhesion can be also controlled uh, through temperature. So here's an example of a thermoplastics 
They can use it to connect and disconnect with the materials, uh, other type of materials. And that's also uh, controllable by temperature. So you're actively adding energy to the system. We can make a soft materials controllable uh, from the mechanical structure. So um, I'm not gonna go into too much more details in soft functional materials because this is not an area of expertise. But I hope you understand that the, um, the soft materials uh, uh, make our uh, soft robotics research a lot more interesting. Um, and, uh, um, and we can actually do more embodied intelligence research based on this uh, approach. So the next part I want to talk about is the uh, soft, sense, uh, soft sensor morphology. I think this is a really important and interesting principle because if we want to understand uh, soft uh, robot intelligence, how we can make a sensor system integrated to the system. Um, because as we see in the previous section, a uh, sensorizing soft structure is very difficult because um, uh, elect uh, uh, electric circuits are usually not soft and the electrical conductivities and the soft uh, materials are not uh, very um, usually in the trade-off situation. So how we can make a sensor system in soft structure is a one challenge, but also we need to think about the morphology of the soft uh, systems. So if we go back to biology, uh, morphology plays a very important role for sensing purposes. So if we look at our sensing systems, uh, our uh, sensor receptors are connected to a lot of diversity, a large diversity of morphology. Looking at our auditory system or tactile system or our vision system, all of them are somehow uh, interface with the mechanical um, design that amplify or that can filter the signals uh, for, uh, for their uh, needs in the, in the survival, <coughs> survival in the animal kingdom. So uh, one of the things we can do uh, with the uh, soft sensor morphology is that we try thinking about how we can uh, um, design the shape of sensors. So in this particular example, uh, we, uh, we started to investigate in um, universal grid bar, uh, but how we can uh, sensorize the universal grid bar with uh, soft conductive materials. Uh, so in this case, uh, we look at uh, soft materials. This black line on the left-hand side figure uh, shows the location of sensors. Uh, so these materials can actually react to the uh, deformation and the electric uh, resistivity can change uh, across the uh, strain. But such a structure can be used to, um, um, to, to uh, give a sensor sensing capability to universal grid bar. So here we made the universal grid bar ourselves and the put sensors uh, on the surface of it. So by adding some sensors, we can actually detect the, the contact with the object, uh, as well as we can detect what kind of object you have in your hand. Um, in, in, in. So uh, how can we do such a, a system um, by, by using uh, soft sensors? So the most important thing is that we uh, use the soft deformable sensor. So as I show you in the, in the previous um, uh, slides, we can have actually the combination of uh, conductive materials. In this case, we have a carbon block together with elastic uh, materials and to put them together and mixing it in the special materials. We can actually make a thermoplastic elastomer uh, with uh, um, con electrical conductivity. So once we have a materials like this, we can deform, uh, we can shape these materials in different uh, shapes, but as well as we can use this shaped structure for the sensing of changing resistivity against the strain. So obviously having a, a resistivity change again the, uh, against the sense, uh, strain is a very important uh, principle here, but how we can make sensitive uh, to the uh, strain is the most important things. And uh, we found it quite interesting that the, how uh, the elastic material, elastomer, uh, can be uh, used for sensor materials compared to other sensing solutions. So now uh, what we can think about is the sensor morphology here. Uh, we need to think about this materials can be deformed into different uh, uh, shapes. So we have investigated what's the good design principles uh, for such a sensor as in salt surface. So here we have shown some examples how these materials 
uh, can be placed in the uh, in the robot. So here we have a, um, a top view of um, of the universal gripper, uh, and then on top on the surface of the universal gripper, we can in, in, uh, install some of the um, uh, sensing materials so that we can actually see different kind of uh, um, uh, sensor signals depending on how we place sensors. So the interesting question here is that if you have a soft uh, body, you have uh, infinity degrees of freedom. Uh, therefore, the deformation can happen in infinity different ways. But on the other hand, the sensor signals have uh, always a discrete uh, input. So we can place the discrete sensor in the continuous surface uh, in a discrete manner. Uh, so how, depending on how we can place discrete sensor on continuous surface, we can actually sense different kind of properties in it. So here we are um, investigating uh, three different ways how we can put such a sensor. So one of them is a looping uh, the sensor materials uh, uh, in, 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 the, um, in a simple way. But here we have uh, two sensors in the, uh, um, in the um, uh, interesting looping way. But also we can put the sensors in uh, other different way. We have a, a 90 uh, degree phase shift on the two different sensor morphology. Of course, the easiest way we can think about the sensing grid. So we can have a many, many sensor required, but we can actually have a, a very good resolution of it. So we need to think about the, uh, the uh, uh, balance between how many sensor uh, resolution we need and how many different kind of things we can sense out of it. So uh, here we have a bit of an uh, analytical approach about uh, sensor morphology and the soft, um, um, soft uh, continuous surface. So if you have a two sensor materials, each of the sensor uh, is uh, in the form of line. But this line is uh, a reactive uh, to uh, a strain of it. So if you have a two sensor material like this, uh, we can actually sense uh, the deformation active, um, acted on this um, materials on this surface here. So if we have a, a, a resistivity change on one sensor, uh, if you have a looping like this, we, it has a different sensor activities on the second sensor. So if we can subtract these two sensor signals, uh, we can actually have the deformation uh, information at the edge of sensor um, uh, in, the, in the looping location. But on the other hand, uh, even if we are using exactly the sensor materials, if we place the sensors in different orientation like this, uh, and then the, uh, the sensor information we get is actually quite different. So what we can gain out of these two sensor materials is the, the, the orientation of a sensor, um, the orientation of the strain. So depending on this uh, angle, uh, angle theta of this uh, strain, we can actually measure uh, the angle of the strain by using this kind of sensor morphology. So as you can see here in the experiment, depending on how you place the sensors, uh, even if you use the exact sensor materials, you can measure the different kind of um, deformation on the surface of the continuum uh, uh, surface. So this is a kind of good um, uh, demonstration of how morphology can play a role in the sensing um, capabilities and which we call this morphological computation for sensor morphology uh, that we can actually illustrate it nicely in this example. Of course, we can extend this kind of principle for more complex uh, sensor morphology. So here's our more recent work about what if we have a more, more, uh, a lot more complex sensor morphology in the system. So in this case studies, uh, we introduce some around, uh, um, uh, joint entropy methods to design uh, sensor morphology. So here we don't uh, do systematic way integrating sensor, but we introduce some. Uh, complexity measure based on entropy to introduce a complex uh, sensor morphology like this, comparing to a usual grid method of the sense uh, soft surface. So the, the interesting thing is that uh, what we can uh, gain, uh, the information we gain from the sensor, uh, the random sensor morphology is actually a lot more robust to the noise uh, if you have a, uh, um, uh, if you're working in a noisy environment. So we have uh, uh, investigated how much uh, noise we can 
uh, cancel from such a random morphology of the sensors, then we actually gain a better performance than a grid sensor a solution like this. Uh, another uh, interesting uh, benefit of random morphology, sensor morphology uh, like this, is that the, when you lose some sensor capability, right? So we have a, a, um, a soft sensor so it has some problems over the lifetime of robots. And once we lose the capability of some of the sensors, how reliable the system can still function. So depending on uh, how you put uh, uh, more complex uh, mor mor morphology in sensors, uh, we can actually have a more robust system, even if you lose the sensor uh, sensors on the way. So that's a really interesting uh, achievement we did uh, in this kind of uh, sensor morphology research. So then uh, the next important uh, challenge is how we can use uh, such a sensor, uh, soft sensors for the closed loop control of soft robots. So one of the things we are uh, investigating at the moment is the control of a uh, closed loop control of uh, anthropomorphic uh, robotic finger like this shown in this picture here. So we uh, integrated the same sensor materials in uh, uh, soft fingers like this. Um, but here we have uh, soft fingers in a sense that these uh, fingers can deform in uh, continuum manner. It's a hundred different way it can deform uh, depending on what interaction you have in, with the environment. Uh, so therefore we need a lot of sensors implemented in this uh, system. We have uh, seven sensors, uh, sensor materials implemented this uh, uh, anthropomorphic fingers. Uh, but the problems of this kind of sensor is that the soft sensor can change its properties uh, over time. So here uh, we have uh, usual um, the force against the sensitivity uh, uh, diagram. But uh, if we do a lot of interaction with the environment, uh, materials uh, properties changes over time and therefore a sensor um, system drift over time. So, uh, so in, and this is not only about our materials, the gasot sensor in general have a lot of drift properties like this, depending on how you interact with the environment. Uh, and the sensor signals are usually like this, right? If you have a time series data while you're interacting with the environment, they're really, really messy raw data you acquire from this kind of sensor data. So how can we deal with such a complex sensor signals in the uh, soft robot sensors is uh, our next uh, big challenge. So, um, you know, if you have a, a complex data like this, uh, what the first thing we should think about is the use of uh, machine learning. So uh, what we have done uh, in our recent experiment is that we implemented some uh, LSTM network uh, so that the uh, robot can automatically pick up the correlation between the sensor signals and the ground truth um, uh, sensor signals. So in this case, a robot can actually do the automatic um, learning of the <coughs> correlation between sensor signals and ground truth force signals. Uh, and then a uh, robot can pick up the correlation with the very complex sensor signals and the ground truth force signal. And then once we train this LSTM network, the robot is able to use this sensor uh, signals for the purpose of closed loop uh, force control in this, uh, uh, in this example. So here, this robot is actually uh, using this complex sensor uh, and the complex sensor signals uh, to uh, maintain the, um, the force with the environment uh, uh, in interaction. So uh, in order to maintain the force uh, level in certain level, the robot tried to react the position uh, so that, um, uh, and then you can see a very nice reaction when the environment is uh, giving a lot of uh, si uh, uh, disturbance, robot try to maintain the signals in, in a certain level. Okay, so uh, I hope this is a really interesting challenge, like how the soft uh, sensors and the machine learning can come together in order to more soft uh, uh, intelligence, soft robot control uh, in the next round. And this, this is uh, actually the, the project started in recent years. And uh, in fact, our paper is still under review and uh, hopefully we can have a collaboration on this kind of research project in the near future. Okay, so, and then uh, the last five minutes or so, I just want to talk about another um, challenging problem of sensor morphology. 
uh, especially uh, con connect connecting a sensor morphology in the context of uh, extended the phenotype. So this is the inspiration uh, coming from a, a spider sensing uh, capability with their uh, spider silk. So uh, the interesting thing is that the spider can extend its uh, phenotype by making its own um, of web. Uh, and the web can be used for sensing purposes, right? So our sensing system is never uh, stay the same. It, it changes over the time. And the extreme case is actually shown in the, uh, in the spider. So we wanted to think about how we can do the extended phenotype of sensing inspired from a, a spider web. So we have a, a lot of interesting uh, functional materials as we show uh, earlier. And in this example, uh, we want to think about how robot can make its own uh, morphology automatically. So in this case, that is we're showing the thermoplastic materials to be used for the 3D printing of end effect of this robot. So this robot is able to uh, do the um, uh, fabrication of its own body by using a 3D printing technique of thermoplastics. So in this particular case, the robot is making a cup and the stick and the bonding them together so that the uh, end effect of robot can be uh, modified automatically by itself. So the robot is able to change its own uh, mechanical structure automatically by itself. So uh, this is a very powerful approach because the robot is able to change mechanical structure for different kind of interaction with the environment. So even with the, the same kind of controller, robot can pick up different kind of objects here uh, because it can change its own morphological shape. And this kind of fabrication is possible because we have a really interesting thermoplastic adhesive materials that can be used for changing morphology of robots. But of course, uh, this kind of mechanism can be used for sensing purposes. And uh, I just want to give you an example of um, how a 3D printing, autonomous 3D printing robots can use for sensing purpose. So here we use the exact same, uh, print, uh, same uh, robot platform, but we think of it in, for the sensing of uh, force and sensing of the temperature. So in this example, Again, uh, robot is uh, fabricating its mechanical structure by using 3D printing technique. Uh, so here robot is making a stick uh, attached to its own body, but this uh, mechanical stick can be used for sensing purpose, right? So in this case, uh, the robot is using the stick to interact with the environment. So here we have a rigid object acting on the stick and the stick it has a relatively soft uh, characteristics and that's why it deforms. Uh, but of course, if you have <clears throat> um, a camera in it, you can actually uh, observe how much deformation you have in this interaction. And the deformation can be uh, seen uh, by camera to measure the force acting on the stick. So just to characterize this kind of um, uh, functions, we have uh, actually uh, compare the soft <clears throat> uh, stick interacting with the rigid object and soft object and see how the formation influence the way how uh, the robot observe the interactions uh, and then how robot can actually perceive the force through the visual sensation. Um, and the similar thing can be applied to the uh, temperature material uh, sensing. So here the robot is making a kind of com complex structure here, like uh, the large block attached to the robot. Uh, but then uh, this materials is made out of, uh, um, made out of the thermoplastic. So it's actually uh, sensitive to the uh, temperature, right? So if you have a, a high temperature materials, these materials of course, you know, uh, melt and fall down. Whereas if you have a room temperature materials, it does not have uh, any um, uh, change in the material. So that's why it stick to the object. And of course the robot can observe uh, this reaction of the materials through the temperature. Uh, and then the robot can actually see, perceive the temperature uh, from the computer vision. So the interesting thing is that again, the sensor morphology plays a role, an important role in the understanding of the uh, external world. So in this case, the robot is actually um, uh, using exact same uh, materials, but the changing the um, sensor morphology, the robot can perceive force and uh, um, the temperature by using computer vision. 
So the, um, the interesting principles of computer vision here is that the, the computer vision analyzes how the deformation of the soft materials, right? The, the computer vision actually measures uh, the deformation of the objects, but uh, actually uh, um, the morphology changeability is playing an important role if we want to change the um, uh, sensing range and the sensitivity. So the material has its own uh, um, capacity of sensing because of the material properties. But if you change the uh, thickness of uh, materials, uh, the robot is able to uh, detect different range of sensing uh, because the, um, depending on the thickness of materials, you can uh, the deformation of the material changes. So actively changing sensor morphology, the robot is able to uh, measure the different uh, sensing range. The same thing can apply to the um, uh, adaptive sensor morphology for the temperature by changing the uh, weight and the diameter of attachment to the robot, the robot can uh, sense a different range of, um, of the temperature. Uh, and uh, again, this robot is able to change the morphology of this material so that uh, a different temperature range uh, can be detected as well as adjusting the sensitivity of the temperature. Okay, so I hope you have a kind of understanding how the sensor morphology uh, plays an important role for the robots to be uh, very adaptive and measuring different uh, aspects of uh, our uh, physical interaction is, uh, with the environment is very, very important. So um, I just want to conclude uh, our um, discussion here uh, with this interesting um, uh, illustration uh, from uh, Understanding Intelligence book by Pfeiffer and Shire. Uh, I think one of the main message of my uh, lecture today is that um, the life of robot could be much easier if we don't need sensors and control, but we actually need the sensor and control if we want to make our soft robots more intelligent. Uh, especially you know, embodied intelligence in the soft bodies and the soft robots need the sensing and control. Um, but uh, you know, sensing and control is not an uh, easy problem because the uh, functional materials uh, is uh, not very uh, um, good with the soft bodies. So how we can do uh, sensors and electronics on the soft bodies is not a trivial problem, but it's a very important challenge we need to solve. Uh, but the, but the, once we have a, a soft sensors uh, and the soft electronics on the soft bodies, uh, we can do a lot of lots of interesting uh, research we can do in the area of soft morphology. Uh, and the soft morphology is a, 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 um, a theoretical challenge because we have a continuum body uh, on the soft surface, but we have only discrete uh, sensing uh, points in the body. So uh, he, here we have a lot of important uh, principles we can find uh, for the purpose of uh, soft robot uh, sensing and control. So the learning of the soft robot is uh, soft robot control is, uh, is a, a very important challenge in the, is the next step as shown in the classroom control in our lecture today. Uh, and uh, we also want to highlight that um, this is gonna be the next uh, important challenge. Okay, so I just want to uh, acknowledge my uh, collaborators and sponsors and especially uh, our colleagues in the um, uh, University of Cambridge has a lot of lots of uh, a stimulating discussion for soft robotics and soft sensing um, for this project. And uh, we have a uh, lot of uh, funding from the uh, European Union as well as the uh, UK RI Research, uh, Research Council uh, for conducting this research. Um, and, uh, um, and then this last slide, uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, if you are interested in more technical details, uh, you can visit our um, website to find our research papers. And you can also find the videos and the pictures from our website. Uh, and uh, I'd like to stop my lecture here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for this very interesting and insightful uh, presentation. Uh, yes, I can see <laughs> hands raised for all questions. Uh, Christian Tamantini, please. 
Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, at first, I would like to thank you for the nice presentation. And I have a curiosity about the control. How do you close the loop in the control system that you presented before when you use the information from the, set, the formable sensor to adapt the control of the robot? Because I, uh, I've seen that you used an artificial intelligence module. So I yes. suppose you're talking about this project, right? Yes, exactly. Okay. Yes. I was wondering about the recurrent neural network that you used in this slide. What are the, the objective of the function? Yeah, thank you for the, the questions. Um, I think this is a very important point that I, I forgot to mention in my slides. Um, so so this in this case study, uh, we, we're, um, we're focusing on the function of force sensitivity, right? So this robot should really react to the force uh, input to the, uh, from the environment. So what we want to do uh, is the, um, this LSTM network uh, estimating actual force um, with respect to the sensor signals, right? So the network should have, uh, pick up the correlation between the, the ground truth force against the sensor, the strain sensor uh, signals here. So the sensor itself is a very uh, noisy and uh, uh, very biased. So the network has to somehow find out the correlation between the system. So before doing this experiment, uh, we have done a lot of uh, experiments. Uh, the robot actually automatically collect the sensor signals while receiving the ground truth uh, force signals and then pick up the correlation of this uh, network, uh, of this force and the sensor signals. And then once this network is trained, we can use this as an estimator of the force so that the robot can do a simple force control uh, P PD uh, feedback. Uh, does that make sense? Yes, yes. So you have used the, the network to map the, the raw no noise input to the estimation of the external force. That's right, okay. yes. Thank you so much. Thank you, Christian, for your question. I, I don't see uh, other raised hand. There was somebody before, but I cannot see anyone. Okay, Manuel Andre Bels Guerrero, <laughs> please. <laughs> um, good day and thank you. Uh, professor, thank you for your very interesting presentation and it's very inspiring. Um, I have a question out of curiosity um, regarding the, the same slide that uh, is showing before. Um, and in respect of the um, LSTM neural network, um, the information is being processed with the help of some kind of neural uh, accelerator. I mean, perhaps the use of a dedicated hardware accelerator uh, chip. Oh uh, yeah, thank you for, for the questions. Um, so uh, yeah, obviously we need a, um, a training of this network and uh, the training require uh, some computation. Uh, and I, I suppose that's what you're talking about, right? So, um, well, Usually, this kind of training of network is uh, uh, very uh, standardized nowadays. So you can actually use a commercial uh, um, uh, services that you, as, as long as you have a data, right? So what we need to really think about is how to obtain the data. Uh, what we did here is about 10 minutes, 20 minutes, you know, continuous uh, up and down of the uh, a robot and collecting sensor signals as well as uh, ground truth force data. But once we get this uh, training data, you can actually use uh, whatever um, the, the, the training services of a, a neural network like this. Uh, you can use uh, you know, the, um, your own uh, GPU, uh, computers so that you can train your network faster, but you know th this is uh, becoming uh, less problematic these days. So we're not really using any 
dedicated hardware per se, uh, but you can use the commercial services like that. Oh, great. M many thanks. Okay, thank you. Okay, so thank you very much, Professor Ida, for this very nice uh, talk. You provided a clear overview of the current activities and uh, in, uh, inspiring um, uh, insights for the next activities and for the future. Thank you again uh, for uh, joining us and see you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, for the students, we have uh, uh, closed the morning session, so you have a break now, and the activities will uh, start again uh, at two o'clock uh, local time. See you later.